So I'm here to talk about something called that I call the CVS Funnel Health Formula. It's meant to give you proactive insights into your funnel, whether it's your own funnel or your clients. And so with that, let us get going. So today's agenda, our short time together, together today, if I can speak, my goal is to make, uh, give you a little typo there, give you three metrics you can use to proactively notice any funnel issues. And really all of this is in the spirit of keeping your clients happy. Because if you've been doing media buying for any length of time, even like a month or two, you know, that's a challenge. Your clients are stressed out and they want insights as much as they possibly can get. All right. So feedback, por favor, uh, that's my little bit of Spanish for today. Uh, you can give me feedback in any of these channels. You can reach me in Pro League, LinkedIn, Twitter, email. I'll put this up at the end as well. But I want your feedback to make this presentation better or just for future topics that you guys want me to talk about. My next one will be on Thursday, November 11th. So instead of the third Tuesday next month, it'll be the second Tuesday. And let's talk about how some media buyers be like. This little kitty here, I have four cats. So I, I like pictures of kitties, There'll be some animals in this presentation. But I think a lot of us can, can relate to this cat because <laughs> not everyone loves uh, not everyone loves media buying, but maybe you do, but especially not everyone loves tracking and analytics. So even if you hate tracking and analytics, I just want you to know that you are safe here. You are safe with me. And if you have bad data days, uh, they can be even worse than bad hair days, but I feel you, even I have bad data days, no matter how much I like this stuff. Some days I just don't want to deal with it. Or some days I just can't find the answers I'm looking for at all. And that's just the nature of life as we were talking about before we started. So just so you know, also to implement the stuff I'm talking about today, you can hire somebody. It doesn't have to be you that's good at all the spreadsheets and the formulas and the automations and everything that it takes to implement um, an automated way of doing this. So don't worry about that. And finally, it's all iOS proof. And that's a big thing these days because iOS devices are gobbling up our pixels. They're not firing correctly. And so we can't trust the data oftentimes that's coming into the ad networks and in other places, even Google Analytics is not as, as trustworthy as it used to be for that reason. So everything I'm gonna show you today is all iOS proof because it doesn't depend on firing pixels whatsoever. All right, but first I just wanted to give you a quick minute about me. Uh, my big giant head is on the screen, it's a little bit too big, but <laughs> we'll be off the screen in about a minute. Um, some of you don't know me, so I just wanted to give you a quick overview of some of the stuff I've done. Uh, I used to be a software engineer, so back when I was a code nerd, aka software engineer, I built a custom tracking analytics platform for the world's number two travel community. That was a long time ago, back in 2005. That company was called virtualtourist.com, which nobody knows about now. Um, it got bought out by the number one in that space, TripAdvisor, which you might know. And I've done tons of tracking and analytics work for different companies, including thanks to Graham. I've done some stuff for ad skills. And um, I spent seven figures across channels on various types of advertising. I'm a nerd for that. I love marketing. I love advertising. It's not just looking at numbers. I'm actually actively running ads. Also in 2018, Upwork put my face at it even bigger than this version. On the, I think it was the giant NASDAQ screen in New York as one of the top freelancers in the US, probably scared a whole lot of people walking by and maybe caused some car accidents. I sure hope not, but it might have. Um, and I'm currently a marketing director at a company called Prehired. We are kind of like ad skills, but we are the uh, top trainer, career training company for people looking to start sales careers at tech companies, oftentimes SaaS, aka software companies. So that is it. I promised you a minute. There it is. Uh, but not everything has gone well. Those were some of the career highlights. But some years ago, I took on a client with a strong personal brand, and she had spent millions on ads over the years. So that was kind of a check. You know, ad skills, they teach you to look for those, those clients that have good things going on for them, and they come in and just amplify that. So she had spent millions. She had positive ROI. It seemed nice. And then I was like, hey, like this kitty here. I was like, hey, let's get after it. And I said, well, let's do this. But she had stopped running ads for several months and she was thinking about resuming ads. And that's where I was coming in. And I figured we could just pick up where she left off in that whole process. So I ran the same campaigns, I used the same targeting as, the, as, as before and the same creative that had performed the best after doing the analysis. And guess what happened? 
it didn't work. So I checked all my setups as again, as skills will teach you to do. And I gave it time. And just like this kitty here, really checking everything. And, and guess what? That also didn't work. So I tested some new targeting, some new creatives, new landing page even. I also tested some other settings in Facebook ads. And even we have even tested YouTube ads. And like this puppy here, I was trying to get that bone. It's really working hard. But guess what happened there? That also didn't work. Uh, and just so you know, for numbers, I was looking at Google Analytics. We had Google Ads because we were running YouTube traffic, Facebook ads, obviously, and then Wicked Reports, which is an attribution tool, gives you some extra insights. And yes, I violated uh, Justin Brooks' one scoreboard rule, which I didn't have in mind at the time. That, that rule says that you should agree with the client on one set of numbers you're going to look at in one dashboard. So I obviously did a bad job with that. Um, but even if I had that, I was still missing the, the most important data source that you can have, which was the CRM data. So like this kitty, I was like, hey, what's in that box over there? And it's the most important box, the CRM, because everything that everyone who opts in, everyone who buys, everyone is going through the funnel, all that data is in there. And the client didn't give me that. She was hesitant for whatever reason. And uh, I sent through hesitation and I didn't press. I should have pressed, right? And she didn't want to report all the needed details into other tools either. Like some of that could have been in Google Analytics or Wicked Reports or other things. We could have pushed that data in, but we didn't. So guess what? It felt like the client ended up seeing the traffic and me as the guy running it as the issues when it all didn't work. And it really, it fell apart. It was massively stressful. So I just wanted to ask you, have you ever had a client misunderstanding over data? Just type it in the chat box. So let's see what, see what you guys have encountered out there. And if you haven't, then you're all rock stars and I'm, I'm the only dummy in the, in the room. Anybody? You can just type yes if you've if ever had a, an issue. Daniel, yep. Matt, yep. I feel ya. Eddie, good to see you, Eddie. Yep, you're saying yep. Tammy, easily. <laughs> you feel me. Anybody with... Uh, any experience. So this is media buying without the right data. And as, as coincidence would have it, this photo was taken exactly 15 years ago to the day, October 21st, 2006, to the day. This was in San Diego, California. I was terrified, did not sleep. I seriously did not sleep well for three weeks before this, this skydiving trip. And I was strapped to this guy named who called himself Tigger, like from Winnie the Pooh. I don't know why he would choose that name. It was the weirdest thing. But I go up in the plane with him and he he senses, he sees that I'm freaking out, honestly, that I'm really nervous. And he says, hey, just pull up those goggles, just relax. And the, the plane door is open. It's this tiny plane. It's hard to relax. But he's like, hey, just pull up those goggles. And he forgets to tell me to put them back down before he jumps out of the plane and takes me with him. And so I'm falling free falling through the air and can hardly see anything. And at the times I do open my eyes, it's just super blurry because when you're falling more than 100 miles an hour and you open your eyes, it, everything is just a blur. So this is me, not at my best moment, but it really reminds me 15 years ago, exactly to the day that this is kind of like media buying without the right data. <laughs> you just can't see clearly what's happening, right? So, but what is the right data? So the right data, because there's so much data you could look at. Yeah, Tammy, flying blind, that's, that's a good way to say it. It needs to tell you what's driving your costs. And it also needs to tell you another thing. It needs to tell you how fast you can recoup your spend so you can go run more ads. That's what we all want to do, right? We all want to help clients scale their business. And we also want to have good work ourselves running those ads. So with that in mind, let's talk about the first letter in the CVS funnel health formula, which is the C. And right before I do that, I want to show you this picture. This is, this is the best picture I could find you know, when you're looking for uh, royalty-free uh, images, and I'm looking for CVS, because Graham, I, I was trying to, to make it a play on words with the CVS pharmacy, because we know them for the pharmacy and for health in the U.S., but, um, and so I was connecting that with, with uh, your funnel health, but this is the best picture I could find, so just infer it in your mind that this guy is standing in a CVS pharmacy, and you get the idea. All righty, so the C stands for conversion percentage. It's not the total number of conversions. And 
I have this picture of a dog jumping through a hoop because that is kind of how it is when we're wanting someone to convert for anything, whether it's on an opt-in page, like even from an ad, they're going to click from an ad. That's a hurdle that somebody has to get over. Or they have to jump through a hoop to do that. And then an opt-in page, they have to opt in and then so on down the funnel, right? So just keep that in mind. C stands for conversion percentage. All right, so you wanna look at conversion percentage. This is really what's important because you all know about conversion percentage, but when you're doing this kind of analysis to get insights, you want to look at it per lead source because different lead sources can convert drastically differently. Google search, there's a lot more intent there uh, versus someone who's coming from Facebook, for example. They just have seen something when they're scrolling through a newsfeed, it's a lot more of a curiosity click. And then Google display, that's very cold traffic. So you just never know what's going to happen. You get a lot of curiosity clicks. So make sure you're looking at conversion percentage per lead source. And you want to make sure you look at this per funnel stage. So what I mean by that is at every point at which a conversion has to happen. So the opt-in page, it's a classic one. Lead source, so maybe Facebook traffic for a given opt-in page, how much of that traffic is converting. And then to compare the numbers now versus before, you need a baseline, right? So the baseline conversion percentage, you're going to take that over probably a couple of months. It's nice if you have three months of data because then you can have a really good baseline, but it, you may actually want to use situationally even a lot less than three months because something drastic might have changed in, in the funnel like a month ago where you just added a whole new step to the funnel or something, you may just want to use a month of data. So it depends on the situation, but if nothing has really changed and how you have set up the funnel and nothing has drastically changed in the market for the last three months, then you can use three months because more data in those situations is better. So again, per lead source, per funnel stage and have a baseline um, time period that you're going to use for all the metrics, the C, the V and the S. Okay, so I'll just repeat that but that's important to keep in mind because that's that's key to getting the good insights. All right, so here's an example. So let's say we're gonna look at the opt-in percentage for Facebook traffic for a specific landing page. And from July to September, it's been 14%, which is pretty average these days. And now in October, it's only 9%. So that's a 35.7% drop. Now the question is what happened there? and Looking at the number by itself is not going to tell you, did you change the copy on the page? Did you change ad targeting? Could, uh, you know, could the season have an effect, right? Coming into October, especially if you're an e-com business, you might start seeing seasonal effects, people shopping for, for occasions like Halloween, and then especially in November, December, the shopping for Christmas and the holidays for gift giving. That's, it's a very different season, right? So here's a common mistake with conversion percentage optimizing conversion percentage at one stage at the expense of later stage. So specifically the biggest mistake many of us make, including me, because I just kind of get caught up in this when I don't remind myself. Uh, many of us want to boost the opt-in percentage on a landing page and we feel really good. It's like this amazing win every time we like get that number up and up and up. Right. But all those extra people that we're allowing into the funnel may not actually buy at all. They may just waste your team's time and cost you money. I've actually heard um, Justin talk about this where he had one client where he actually, I think he reduced the opt-in percentage and the client was like, oh, your, your landing page is worse. But then he was able to show that they actually got more sales from people that came through his opt-in page because they were framed. They, they had a different mindset coming in to the funnel. So it's a huge, huge thing to keep in mind. All right, so that's the C. The V in CVS is volume. And uh, if you have this many dogs in your house, you probably have some challenges. <laughs> um, I used to have six cats. I have four now. So I understand your challenges. Graham, you've got some kids. So <laughs> you understand volume, volume challenges. But in marketing, oftentimes volume is good as long as it's quality, right? Coming into the funnel. So just like we had conversion percentage, this is the number of the number of actual conversions. Just so keep, keep that in mind. And I'll remind you again that it's important to look at volume per lead source, per funnel stage, and using the same baseline time period as before. You want to compare everything, um, really apples to apples, same lead source, same funnel stage, same baseline time period that you're using for your comparisons. So here's an example. 
during July through September, you got, let's say, 87 opt-ins for a day, and you were spending 500 bucks a day on Facebook. Now, in October, you're only getting 63 opt-ins per day uh, with the same daily budget on Facebook. So why did the opt-ins go down? Again, we don't know by just looking at the numbers, but it gives us a proactive signal to say something changed here for this lead source and for this stage of our funnel. Let's see what's happening. Did our CPM go up? CPM being cost per thousand impressions. So that's the advertising cost. Did that go up? Or are we actually getting a lower ad click-through rate? Fewer people clicking through on our ads for whatever reason, even if it's the same targeting, the same ads, everything. Um, or maybe your page just isn't converting as well before as before for some reason. Like everything else is the same, but that's not that's not working. Or it could be more than one of these factors, right? And that's that's often real life. It's often more than one factor. So here's a common mistake with volume: comparing volume from a previous time period with your uh, with daily budgets that were different than they are now. So. For example, if you scaled spend, you're going to get more volume now. And so you can't compare it like that. What you need to do instead to normalize the data is you need to look at cost divided by volume. So cost per lead or cost per application or cost per sale. The volume can be tricky in that particular way. The S in CDS is, stands for speed. And we got two dogs racing each other here. Uh, it's how fast people or animals perhaps if you're selling to animals, which I don't know any of you are, uh, but if you, if you are selling to whoever you're selling to, that's how fast they're moving between every stage of your funnel. How fast are they going from opt-in to sale is the most common metric for speed. Like Wicked Reports calls that sales velocity. Um, and there's other tools that, that measure that specifically, but I suggest really breaking down per funnel stage, because then you can start to see like, where are people really getting held up? And is something, drastically changing in a given stage. And like before, you wanna look at this per lead source, per funnel stage, and using the same baseline time period. And uh, before I go on to the next slide, Eddie, you mentioned user engagement on file is also a good metric to look at by channel. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of good things you can measure um, by channel. That, that is one of them. It just depends uh, exactly what your offer is too. So the, uh, the example Eddie gave is we're seeing Facebook brings higher volume and cheaper leads, but Google brings Google and YouTube bring leads that convert downstream and stay engaged with email three times more. Yeah, and that's really good that you're connecting the dots like that because most marketers don't. I mean, they're, they're looking at just like opt-ins by itself in isolation, whereas really marketing is an entire system. And if you're able to see what happens here and connect it with what's happening way downstream, then then you're playing an advanced game. That's, that's really good. It's really good that you're doing that, Eddie. So per lead source, per funnel stage, and same baseline time period for the S as well. So an example of that is, again, July to September, the median time for Facebook leads to buy after opting in was two days, let's say. Now in October, they're taking four days. Why would that be happening? Well, maybe some step got added to the funnel. Maybe some website copy got changed, right? Or maybe the traffic just isn't as good and we need to go and diagnose that. Um, you, all, you all know that traffic just fluctuates in quality. It just It is what it is. And um, you might have to increase your bids or do any number of other things, right? So a common mistake with speed, or there's a couple of common mistakes with speed. One of them is changing your funnel structure and expecting speed to stay the same. So the easiest example there is that if you added a whole new step, like making them apply to talk to somebody, let's say it's a high, high ticket coaching funnel or something, whereas before, like before they had an application, but it was three questions. Now it's 15 questions. Um, not only is your conversion percentage and volume likely to go down, but if you have to remind people a bunch of times to come back and finish it, your speed will probably also you know, come down with that. So these metrics often go hand in hand in that, in that sense. Also, you need to factor in speed when projecting how fast you can scale because bottom line is if they don't, the faster that they get to actually buying from you and giving you money, the faster you can take that money and go back and cycle that back into advertising. So some marketers have an advantage with a big credit line with certain networks. It could be like Facebook gives you like a quarter million dollars in a credit line, that's awesome. 
It's just that you will run out of that credit line. It'll top up and then you will have to pay it down. And how do you pay it down? You have to pay it down by actual revenue that you or actual cash, right? That you can pay it down with. So, and a lot of clients may not share all of that data with you up front. So it's really key to keep these metrics in mind so you can have the right conversations and get access to that data very much like I didn't do in my, my little story, right? So you might be wondering how to implement all of this. And this is not meant to be a technical deep dive because that would take a long time. And it, I don't know if it would bore you or what, just depending on your, uh, your interest. But uh, I do want to give you an overview of how you can go about implementing this. So the first step is on your opt-in pages, you need to grab the UTM parameters from the URL and then sync them when people opt in into your CRM. So that takes some JavaScript code usually. That's how I do it. Um, and in some cases, if you're using WordPress and ActiveCampaign, certain combinations of tools, there are even plugins that will do that for you, or you might have to get someone to, to create that for you, but it's usually not that hard. And then for every person in the CRM, you also need to store the lead source. I suggest storing it by where they first opted in from. And then you need to store the current lead status, i.e. their stage. I'm, I'm using those words interchangeably. And then you need to store also the date and time of every lead status change. Now, you're not going to do any of those updates manually because that would be way too tedious and just not very accurate. Instead, you're going to use automations whenever you possibly can to make marking all of these fields easier. And most CRMs have some way of, of, um, of automating these different types of changes that you can, because these are pretty simple, like lead source, for example, um, you can have an automation that marks that UTM source, let's say it's equal to Facebook, uh, set the lead source property equal to the, that UTM source. And then you can also have an automation that, that notices when uh, it's trying to overwrite that and then maybe generates a task for you to change it back or just prevents it from getting overwritten in the first place. Um, and for every lead status change, you can have automations for those things too. And there's usually like ways to just automatically mark the date and time of lead status changes. Of course, all of that takes some work to build out. All right, so step two, to crunch the numbers. Here, you're gonna export CRM data. It's usually into a CSV file, which has nothing to do with CVS. Don't get those confused. CSV file stands for comma separated values. It's just a way of taking data from your CRM and being able to easily export it in a common format that you can directly paste into uh, a spreadsheet. And whether you want to use Google Sheets or Excel, they're both good. I like Google Sheets because you're able to easily share that with the client and you're able to make updates in the cloud and not have to worry about losing the file, all of that. But you can use either one. And then I suggest having a raw data tab where you paste in your, your CRM data and then having a raw data, raw data tab for each app that works uh, cost. So for example, you, you, you take your Facebook data from ads manager, you have a report you can export and then you paste it in its own tab and you can do the same thing with Google, like YouTube traffic and then Google display and whatever else you're running, TikTok, whatever. Just to make it simple um, in terms of, or clean maybe is a better word. I don't know if, if you would agree with simple. And then step three, again, this is at a high level. There's also lots of micro steps here, but at a high level, uh, st a step three would be make what's called a pivot table. That's really just a feature in, in the spreadsheet software. It'll help you make a table that looks kind of like this. And it'll have lead source, lead status, and the month, and then the number of people. So it'll look pretty similar to this. And then you're gonna be able to take that data as like a data table that you can look up data into, meaning you can pull data from it. And the way you do that is with this VLOOKUP function, you pull data from that pivot table into a summary tab, then you can review the conversion percentage, you can review the volume, and it can be all broken down by lead source and lead stage because you, you made the table like that, right? Speed can be a little trickier to calculate, one way to do it is calculate the, the time between lead status changes that you care about. Let's say you want to go between opt-in and sale. That's the easy one for a given person. So on that row for that person, you're going to calculate that, how fast they went between the two. 
you're going to subtract the dates and do the math and have a calculated column. So for every row, you're going to have that number, how fast they went from opt-in to sale. And then across all these rows, you're going to do a median math function and you're going to be able to get the middle value for, which is a form of average for how long it took people to go from opt-in to sale. So that's, that's at a high level of how to do that. So you might have some, some of these questions. These are really frequently asked questions. Are there tools to do this for me? Well, uh, that is, that is probably the most common question. I haven't seen any one tool to do all of this and go ahead and type in the chat though. If you've seen tools that can really do all of this, because there are definitely tools that I'm not uh, familiar with and may be able to do more of this than I, I currently think. Although spreadsheets are really flexible and I really like spreadsheets because I can I can change it to be however I want, but the downside is it's more work. So for example, Google Analytics uh, has a funnel visualizing report. It can help you see conversion percentages, for example, per stage, but it won't be as accurate as CRM data because even though there are some ways you can import Google do like data into Google Analytics, but it's not as reliable as, or it's not as easy really as, as um, some other, like getting into a spreadsheet definitely is way easier. But otherwise Google Analytics is depending on a pixel firing correctly and it's, it's more, more iffy these days. Although I hear Google has some tricks up their sleeve to make it more accurate, but I just have no idea how that works exactly. And Wicked Reports, which is a third-party paid tool, has a sales velocity report, that's what they call it, but it won't show you speed for funnel for each funnel stage. From what I've seen, it just shows you like basically when they come in the system to how fast they buy. Wicked Reports is very focused on revenue, which <laughs> makes sense, but um, I do want to see it broken down more per stage. Here's another question. When I noticed numbers got worse, how do I know what to look at first and to change? Like if I notice the numbers got worse, what do I look at to see what broke or what should I go and change to make the numbers better? So here again, ad skills has good advice, which is keep a, keep a really detailed journal of your ad campaigns. Every campaign you're running, what date and time you make any change at all. That's how I do it. And I have a Google sheet that I use to record all of that. It's got a couple thousand rows now of, various ad campaign changes I made. And it just helps. Like anytime I, I noticed that something went crazy three days ago, I'm like, well, what did I change three days ago? Because it's hard to remember when you're doing so many different steps in your business, or you're just doing so many things. It's like, well, what exactly did I change three, three days ago? And then I suggest having a similar journal for all funnel changes too. This can be trickier because if you're working with clients and they're not telling you all the funnel changes, then it's hard to know, but if you, the better relationship you can have with a given client where they can, um, they know that you care about this, then they can be proactive in telling you, hey, this copywriter changed this landing page or this thing just went live or, you know, we stopped, we, we swapped out this welcome email sequence. Here's the new sequence. And you can note all that stuff down and try to correlate the changes in performance to the changes in the funnel. When you combine these two things, the changes in the ad campaigns and the changes in the funnel, then you can have a complete picture or as close to a complete picture as you realistically can have because yeah, you're gonna forget to, to log some things and so is the client, but the more you can do to do these things, the better. Also, how often should I look at these numbers? Well, ideally every day, but really at least once a week. If you're spending a thousand dollars or more per day, I'd, I'd say it's ideal to look every day, but again, getting all the text out of in place to do that is challenging. So do what you can, because anything that's above and beyond what you're doing now is, is a win really. And when should I discuss these numbers with a client? Ideally before even talking that taking them on as a client, uh, I don't mean like in-depth analysis of their data before you take them on because that's just not reasonable. But although you could, if you want to be, if you want to really understand who you're taking on as a client, you could do like a full-on audit. You can actually charge them for that. That's not a bad idea either. Some people will say that that makes sense. And I, I do suggest doing that if, if you're comfortable with that. Um, but I'd say at least get their agreement that you're going to look at these numbers together and it's going to be part of your one scoreboard along with any other metrics that you think are really important to have on that one that one scoreboard. All right, so quick summary. The C stands for conversion percentage. V stands for volume, which is the number of conversions. 
And the S stands for speech, which is how fast leads go between these stages, right, in your funnel. And together, the numbers help you control your costs and recoup your ad spend ASAP so you can go run more ads. And all of these stats are iOS proof because they're not depending on any pixels firing. You are depending on storing UTM tags and CRM data, which that's data that you and your client can control. So you can export that data and, and go through that data in whatever format you want, which is just basically what I'm suggesting here, right? 